Okay, um, so I guess from the very start, I would first like to say that I had a really great childhood. What I would like to consider normal, I guess. Like I had two amazing parents, they did everything above and beyond for me. And then I graduated high school and I moved to New Mexico for college. Got in a relationship and I walked in on him one night smoking something, I don't know what it was. And he was like, oh, this is marijuana wax, you know, THC. Do you want to try it? And I said, well, you know, I've smoked weed a couple times. I liked it. So, yeah, I'll, I'll try it. So I smoked it, and I was like, oh, my gosh, like, this is amazing. So we smoked it for the next couple days. And, like, the fourth or fifth day, he just broke down crying. And I was like, what's wrong? And he was like, on oh, that stuff that we've been smoking, it's not wax, it's heroin. And I was like, what? Just like a scene from a movie, you know? I packed all my stuff, I was yelling at him, I left, I went back to my apartment, and he showed up, and he was crying, and he was just begging, you know, to give him another chance, that he was gonna go to rehab, get help, you know, all this stuff. And I stayed, I stayed with him, and um, it was just a snowball effect from there, so that's how I originally got started. I became an addict at probably early high school. It was actually whenever um, I was going to the dentist, actually for my wisdom teeth is what I believe started it because the dentist was writing me a prescription for pain pills literally like weekly for almost a year straight. So after that I was, it was bad. I had a really bad addiction and I got addicted to oxycodone. There you are, that's it, that's all you gotta do. 32 and a half Yay. inches all day, you can go now. See, that's it, okay. <laughs> but it was the most horrible feeling in the world just to be like sober and it was crazy to, it sounds crazy, but it was. I just didn't feel normal. I felt out of body almost, but whenever I took the pain pills, I felt normal. And a lot of times whenever I would go to the doctor, they were, I was classified as drug seeking, and you know what I'm saying, they, weren't, they wouldn't help me. And of course, they looked down on me and they judged me and things like that. Before I had my son, like I was an IV heroin addict and that took me to some really, really dark places. Um, I ended up homeless and was selling myself for drugs. I had to go to treatment to be able to get out of the environment. But when I finally was able to stop using and like had, you know, consecutive months of clean time, um, like I, it was a miracle to me. And that's not what I saw reflected back to me from the hospital social worker or the DCFS worker. I felt almost like they didn't care to know how far I'd come or anything like that. There was one time that I did actually overdose and uh, the doctor walks in. I don't know, maybe he was just over it, like he was sick of seeing so many people OD. And he's like, well, you died. And he's like, but I guess it could be worse. You can, you should consider yourself lucky because this isn't a situation where I have to come in here and tell your family that you're gonna be brain dead the rest of your life. I get it and I'm sure you're sick of seeing it, but I mean, that approach is not gonna help anybody. That's just gonna do the complete opposite. There was one nurse in particular that I felt like treated me like nothing I did with my son was right and she tried not to let me do anything to care for him. When I started figuring out the shifts of the nurses and I knew she was going to be there, like, oh, sorry, I had to like mentally prepare myself for dealing with her. And I feel like if they were people, the doctors and stuff were more open about it and they made people feel more welcome and didn't, like I say, classify them as soon as they walk in and put the X on their chart and send it away. You know what I'm saying? It, it would help a lot more people and in a turn, it would be a lot better community and world for that matter. <laughs> yeah. I can go back and tell you 20 years ago when I started working at the hospital, 
I can see where I failed as a social worker because my training was not so much it was a disease process. It was more like it was a choice and they needed to be um, reprimanded for their poor choices and the consequences and the stigma was you're a drug addict and you're, you know, you're never gonna change and your babies are gonna be born with this. It's hard to think of a more stigmatized experience than being pregnant and having a substance use disorder. So if you are a postpartum person and you know you have a newborn, you go to your child's pediatrician over here at this clinic over here. Um, you get your postpartum care from your OB at this clinic over here. Your mental health treatment is almost definitely a, a separate facility. Um, and that's, you know, that's three different medical staffs, that's three different front desk folks, that's three different providers. And for that patient, it's potentially three different opportunities to face stigma, judgment, and fear of legal consequences. And, and those fears are real. So when I first found out I was pregnant, the word on the street was, you can't go to the doctor. If you go to the doctor and they test you and you're positive, your baby's gonna get taken. This is what I pictured in my head. They were gonna be there like waiting as I'm giving birth to like take the baby away from me. Like I, I did, I used to be scared to tell the doctors that I was of my past because I thought they were gonna judge me or they were gonna look down on me that I denied the fact that I was pregnant so I was almost seven months old. I was really scared to come in and thinking they're gonna think I'm like the most horrible person in the world that I've been neglecting my prenatal care. We see situations where moms will wait to the last minute and they come in here and either have the baby en route or right after they get here. Um, they're more apt to leave the hospital against medical advice or not want to stay in room in. They just feel hopeless. I mean, they've voiced that to us, that it's, uh, there's no way out. I think when patients show up with no care to our hospital, we often automatically assume that this is a choice that they've made. We need to really think about how we're talking to these patients and about these patients. I think we're realizing with stigma and bias in general in medicine that it is a continuous educational process and that none of us are perfect and that we have to also be able to call each other out when we have a bad day and we say the wrong thing. Um, hey, this is, you can't call this patient an addict. We need to talk about what is going on in their environment and how to help them. When I go in to meet with these mothers, um, I kind of meet where they're at. You know, whatever's going on in their life, that's where we're meeting. And uh, it's actually worked so much better because I later see these mothers with their babies. The mothers coming in the hospital. I see the mothers at the local Walmart bringing their babies to me and say, Miss KK, I want you to see my baby. They see me as on their team, not as the, the dictator telling them what to do, they see that I was there to try to help them. It's a medical condition, just like we would not blame someone for having hypertension. We would treat their hypertension, we would treat them with care, we would treat them with kindness. We have to understand that substance use disorder is also a medical condition, and it's not a moral failing. Being on the buprenorphine of those patients, it's, it's a game changer, it's critical to treatment is critical to success, short and long term. That was a godsend, that medicine is. Yeah, I thought it was gonna be like, like I was gonna have cravings or the urges to, you know what I'm saying? I thought it was gonna be really a lot harder than, than it was. Uh, yeah, I could be the spokesperson for it because I've, if anybody can stay off of drugs going through what I've gone through, just being on that medicine, I think it's pretty good stuff. You know what I mean? Suboxone helped save my life. Like, I, I wouldn't say it was the only thing that saved my life, but without it, I don't feel that I would be here today. I'd probably be dead. <laughs> it is a relatively easy thing to do once you've had the training, um, and it is extremely rewarding to see somebody whose life has turned around, to see what a difference it can make in their lives. <laughs> From my very first visit, just to paint like a a mental picture. So my first visit, they had brought me from the jail. So I'm in, you know, black and white stripes, handcuffs, orange flip-flops, and I'm already like mentally preparing for the judgment that I'm going to receive. I was four months pregnant at the time, and this doctor walked in, and he had a big old smile, and he was like, hi, Miss Rachel, how are you doing? As if I was just any other patient. That's how he talked to me. And I was so shocked. I mean, it caught me way off guard. You know, I just, I didn't really have a lot of self-esteem. 
I had zero hope. Like I accepted that I was gonna die a heroin addict. Like I had accepted that a long time ago. And they just made me feel human again. With Rachel, her dad called me and he said, you saved my daughter's life. Your facility saved my daughter's life. And he was crying. And he said, we lost her. We lost her for eight years. He said, but you gave our daughter back to us. And he said, I, I want to come to your house. I want to cook supper for you and your family. I want to meet your family. And he came and they met with my family. And I mean, I, I can't even describe that, that interaction and what it means to me and the work we've done. Once you say that one, then you're hooked. You want to save another one. Now I'm like a mother that has a job and helps other people and I'm trusted by everyone around me. I mean, I have keys to the church where we do our meeting, okay? Like if, you know, years ago someone would have told me I would be doing the things I'm doing right now in my life, no, I would have laughed in their face and been like, no way because I had given up on myself, I really had. But um, there's always hope, I feel.